Cosmetics are part of all of our patients' lives, whether we're male or female. Females typically use about 15 different products on their faces each day, and males use about nine. So all day long, every day, um, whether it's a cleanser or a cream, that, that product may be in contact close to our eyes all day long. And the problem is that patients don't understand that some ingredients in these self-care products could be negatively impacting their ocular surface. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Clinical Podcast Series. My name is Andrew Pucker. I'm the Senior Director of Clinical Medical Sciences at Lexitas Pharma Services. And today I'm joined by our expert, Pam. Pam, could you please introduce yourself to our audience? Great. Thanks for having me here today, Dr. Pucker. I'm Pam Terrio. I am the Clinical Director of the Dry Eye Center at Lusk Eye Specialist in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I'm also a member of the Public Awareness Committee for the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society their lifestyle workshop. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Exactly, yep, Pam is an expert on this topic. We're gonna specifically talking about the paper title from TFOS, The Impact of Cosmetics on the Ocular Surface. So Pam, could you give us a little overview of this topic and why we should care about it? Well, indeed, cosmetics are part of all of our patients' lives, whether we're male or female. Females typically use about 15 different products on their faces each day, and males use about nine. So all day long, every day, um, whether it's a cleanser or a cream, that, that product may be in contact close to our eyes all day long. And the problem is that patients don't understand that some ingredients in these self-care products could be negatively impacting their ocular surface. So that's what the report has intended to uncover. and then let us know what to watch out for. Yeah, I found it super surprising. I'm also actually on the public awareness committee with Pam, which is kind of why we're here today. And reading through that report, I didn't really realize how drastic the differences are between the United States and Europe. So Pam, kind of, could you unfold or unlock what the main differences are in regulations for cosmetics in the United States and probably elsewhere in the world? Right, so the European Union is known to ban about 1,300 different chemicals from ingredient lists of their self-care products that are sold in their countries. However, here in the US, we ban 11, one, one, 11 total products, right? Our total ingredients. And so we are far behind on our regulation. Um, according to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, Cosmetic product ingredients other than color additives do not have need FDA approval before they go to market. So these companies can just come out with products and just present them straight to the to the population without any regulation at all. And so that's how um, a lot of damage can be done to the ocular surface, as I was saying, because it has such a long contact time close to the eye, um, and these chemicals can be harmful to the structures. I find that absolutely shocking. There's hundreds of chemicals banned in other countries, whereas in the United States, it's just 11. And honestly, I'm probably using some of the banned ones. So um, what are... Right, what we, are, we all are, right? <laughs> yeah, we probably all are, not knowing it. Um, so what are some of the ones that we should worry most about? So you can look at a package and see on the back, what are the things I should be looking out for and maybe not buying those specific products? Right, so I think there's been some hype in regular cosmetics to be paraben free and phthalate free. You can pick up lots of products and see those labelings. You may also see organic or all natural or hypoallergenic. But those labels don't actually say that all of the ingredients are going to be non-toxic. So you have to be a little bit of a label reader, and particularly you're going to want to watch out for formaldehyde. Now formaldehyde is used as a preservative, and in fact it's found a lot in eyelash extension glue. So most of the glues used for eyelash extensions contain formaldehyde, and it has been known as a carcinogen, right? We all kind of, oh, formaldehyde, we know that one. But it's also toxic to the human epithelial meibomian gland cells. 
So while that glue is sitting very close to the ocular surface and the eyelids all day for months and months at a time, the formaldehyde is coming out and causing damage, permanent damage perhaps, to the meibomian glands. I think in another context, one, like that's the things they use to preserve cadavers, right? That's like the smell. Exactly. The <laughs> exactly. That's how we embalm people is formaldehyde. <laughs> and then we're putting it really close to our eyeballs at the same time with the, the eyelash glue. Another one that you might not realize as you're reading through your ingredient list is that fragrance can be highly toxic as well. Potentially, it's one of the biggest causes of allergens close to the ocular surface. Um, and it can be found to cause migraines and exacerbate asthma. So um, these products that have just something as simple as, oh, a nice fragrance to it could be irritating your eyes for sure. Is there any other interesting tidbits you learned in this paper that you think the audience would want to know about? So the, the other interesting thing that came up was that sharing of cosmetics should be a big, big no-no. I think intellectually we can all imagine this, but when you're in, um, let's say you're getting ready to go to uh, a wedding or an event with your best girlfriend and she tells you that she forgot her mascara. Well, you wouldn't think twice about handing her your mascara and saying, oh, okay, well, I've got one. Here you go. Um, I think it's something that it's more common than we realize that people share their cosmetics. But what this, the paper found was that the more users and the older the product, the higher the levels of bacteria, viruses, demodex, and fungus, because if you're not throwing that out on time, um, then some funguses can grow in the tubes of the makeup and especially the mascara tubes where the wand is getting dipped and applied and then re-dipped and staying in there. It's a real big um, like cesspool <laughs> in there once it's yeah. contaminated. There's nothing to keep it from growing, really. So it's so, kind of like that's another toothbrushes. You don't want to share that, right? So maybe not share your cosmetics. And that's yes, really a kind yes. of a timely thing. Like there's the FDA recall on drops right now because they're not sterile and potentially could cause eye infections. And I think these cosmetics could do a similar thing if you're really unlucky. It's probably not going to happen, but you, you don't want to risk it, right? Right. Even an, an unsightly sty or more blephritis than you used to have because, you know, you got somebody else's staff on you from sharing mas mascara or eyeshadow. The other is when you go to a beauty counter and you're testing samples, you want to make sure they're using a fresh tester each time to apply it to your eyes. You know, if they're even re-dipping with the, the eyeshadow wand and then re-dip into the shadow, you know, eh, contaminated then. So something to watch out for. Yeah, if I I guess I go to the big box store, I might just start scolding people like, hey, don't do that. You're going to cause an eye infection. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there was yeah. another kind of cool aspect in this uh, set of papers. They did systematic reviews. I think there was one on eye gro eyelash growth. Do you have any takeaways from that portion of the paper? Yes. Yeah, so the systematic review, as, as Dr. Bucker said, in each of the segments of the TFOS report, um, looked at one specific thing. And what the cosmetics report looked at was eyelash growth serum. And they picked out a couple of things I just want to go over because it's so commonplace in our patients. Whenever I have a patient who has gorgeous long lashes, I always ask, are oh, those your natural lashes or are you doing something to make them look that way? Um, it's just kind of a casual way of bringing it up because we all know that the Mataprost um, has been used in ophthalmology and optometry for more than a decade, right? We've all prescribed it ourselves and we know that it lengthens lashes by extending that growth cycle um, and depositing melanin so it makes them look darker and longer, which is fabulous, but it's a prostaglandin. And if we think about it, prostaglandins are pro-inflammatory. So it can really cause a problem with long time use of these products. Um, what we found is that um, it can cause you know, increased pigmentation, redness to the lash, uh, the lid margin next to the lashes. And with prolonged use, you can actually get that uh, orbital fat loss, 
um, and some really traumatic side effects that I think these women who are using it as eyelash growth serum just don't know about. The word that's most commonly found in the ingredient list for these growth serums is isopropyl cloprostinate. Um, that's the um, generic or the, the what's the word, um, synthetic version of the prostaglandin that they're using in the mascaras. Um, and, but what they found in this systematic review is that there actually weren't enough studies done to judge the impact of these serums on patients' signs and symptoms of ocular surface disease. So really we need to dive a little bit deeper so that we can prove to the uh, cosmetic companies that they're using these products is not safe without checking with an uh, eye care provider. So it sounds like there's a need for more research, though there is a lot of talk about our glaucoma patients having bad ocular surface disease, potentially from the drops. So I think there is some data out there, but not enough to synthesize. Is that kind of your interpretation? Right. I think by the time they weeded through, they started with like 5,000 different papers to look at, but the ones that were actually done and scientifically based, they didn't have enough to base the, the, the report on um, linking the signs and symptoms to the use of the prostaglandin analog. Product. Yeah, that makes sense. And this kind of sets up a um, roadmap for future studies to do it right. So hopefully we have that data the next time they update this TFOS report, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be fabulous. So with that, I'd like to thank Pam for joining us today. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to this podcast and I hope to see you on another one soon. Thank you. Thank you.